We better get started. So I think the plan, so today will be a 15 minute review, uh, review session for CS 161 midterm. So I think the format is going to be like this. So first I'm going to talk, about, I'm going to give you guys a review of all the topics in the class so far. And this is a compression of half a quarter into like 20 minutes. So if you didn't understand, and it, so um, if you didn't know about anything at all, then you shouldn't expect that you can learn on those in the section. But this, these are better like um, something to give you a refreshment on, on these things. And so um, I'm planning to spend about 20 to 25 minutes on, on, on all of these topics. And then I will be answering questions. And then after that, if we still have time, then I'm going to give you guys some practice problems. And we can go through some practice problems to get on the board. Is that a good plan? OK. And uh, can anybody hear me right? Yeah, OK, sure. So, uh, so these, are, these are the topics that you will, will, you will have a chance to see on the midterm. Um, some of these will be more likely to occur than others. So I can say for very sure you will have a problem. Uh, one pro you, so you, you will have three problems in the midterm. Uh, one of them will be like one of your homework exercises where you will be given a bunch of recurrences and just solve all of them. Um, and then there will be two other problems, um, one short problem and one longer, uh, longer problem. So those, that will be the format of the midterm. And I think uh, asymptotic analysis is the first topic that we will have to cover because it's really important. So, um, uh, the f so here I'm, gi I'm giving you a refreshment of the notation of the O, um, big O, um, omega and theta notations. So I hope everyone is familiar with this one. So if you have two function f and g and you say f, is, so if f is smaller than g, smaller in quotation, in, in the sense that you are seeing on the screen, then you say it's big O. If f is larger than g, then it's big theta, sorry, then it's big omega, and then, and then if f is both in big O and big omega of g, then you say it's theta. Clear on this? Okay, so in practice, uh, when you analyze uh, the complexity of the algorithm, we will mostly ask for the big O notation because big O kind of gives you the upper bound of the running time of the algorithm, and we are basically more interested in that. Um, there are some there are some useful stuff that I'm uh, some useful uh, equations about big about big O notations that I'm showing here. So. Um, so you, sh you should be able to prove on this thing formally by you know, taking the existence of C1, C2, existence of N0, and s stuff like that to derive on this, all of these equations. But uh, I think these equations at this point are obvious enough for anyone to just apply them, as I'm showing here. So if you have two, you ha so, um, so, the, so big O notation of the sum of two things, you can just sum them over, or you can just take the thing that is bigger. Um, and big O of the product is just, um, so product of two big O's is just a big O of the product. OK, so um, I'm going to give you an example on the big O notation. So uh, on the screen I'm showing, on the, on the left, I'm showing the uh, matrix multiplication algorithm. And this is the, it is a very naive approach. So um, and you're, you are asked to analyze this algorithm. So uh, um, by using the summation of big O, you can break the programs into smaller chunks, and then you can analyze each of these chunks individually and then sum them up. So in this case, the first part of the program is going to be for the lines from th line 3 to line 7. And so you see that there are two nested for loops. And when you have, whenever you see nested for loops, then it is a time that you can use uh, the multiplication of big O notations. So here you see that there are two for loops. One, one, the outer for loop, the, the for loop at line 3 runs for m times, and the, for, the nested for loop in line 4 runs for p times. So that gives you an OM times OP, which is OMP, as said before. Uh, similarly, in line 8 to 14, you see there are three nested for loops, and so the same argument applies. And overall, you can just sum those to the overall. So line 3 to 8, and sorry, 3 to 7, and then 8 to 14, those are separated, so that you, are, you just sum them together. Or you don't need to take a photo. I'm going to upload on the slides onto Piazza later. Um, 
Yeah, so and then you sum this thing over, and you know that MNP will always dominate MB. So the, the final result is only just O of MNP. Okay, so this this is a very simple example of big O notations. And uh, when you have to, in the midterm, you will be asked, I'm, I'm sure you will be asked to design some algorithm. And then if you can phrase your algorithm in some, in some forms of pseudocode, then you can just use this kind of analysis. Okay, um, so, um, so uh, the big O notations that I, I, as I just showed, they are good for solving linear programs. I mean, linear programs are the programs that doesn't have uh, um, any Kong to itself. It's not recurrence. So you can just break them down and then use the, the adding or the multiplication rule to, uh, to, to analyze the complexity. But uh, there, are, there are cases where you, where you will have to, uh, f mm, to phrase your complexity in terms of a recurrence. And those are actually the bigger problems. So we'll talk about recurrences. So there will be three ways to solve recurrences, the master theorem, the substitution method, and the recursion tree method. Uh, so I, the, the easiest thing to do is master theorem. So the scary thing here is called master theorem. There are three cases. You should either memorize these or write them into your cheat sheet. And I recommend writing them into your cheat sheet because these are this hard to memorize and not very long to write down. Um, so um, Master Theorem is easy in the sense that uh, it only solves one kind of recurrence. So, and that is the recurrence that I'm showing here. So t, if, uh, if there is only one con to the recurrence, uh, multiply by a product or something plus a function. Then you can then depending on the on that function, you can decide which case of master theorem you can use. Um, uh, there's only one thing that I want to note about master theorem. That is, you should be careful uh, in case one and case three. Make sure that there is an epsilon, an epsilon greater, strictly greater than zero. Because if it's um, yeah, you, you need to have something strictly greater than zero. Otherwise, you will just fall into the, the, the second case. And in the third case, the, the constancy must be less than one. So there, we have been seeing mis these kind of mistakes in the homework. So this is something I just want to note down. So master theorem is the, is the simplest way to solve recurrence. If you, see, uh, if you see a situation like this, then just use master theorem. Okay. Uh, second thing, uh, the, the second method seems to be a little more complicated, the uh, substitution method. So uh, mm, substi substitution method, uh, it is just a way to prove a uh, up an upper bound of a recurrence. It doesn't help you to find the upper bound. So if you have a recurrence and you want to solve it using a uh, substitution method, the first thing you have to do is you have to guess uh, the upper bound, uh, like what you are trying to prove. Um, and so... Uh, uh, ideally, we will want the upper bound that you get to be tight, but if you cannot get the tightest bound like we are expecting, then you will still have the partial credit provided that you do the rest uh, correctly. And so once you have an upper bound, as shown here, um, uh, you, you just based on the definition of the big O notation to, uh, um, to prove the bound that you, that you guessed. So, um, so I have been seeing these kind of questions in the office hours. So basically, when if you want to say that Tn is the function you are trying to analyze, that is, it is in big O of Gn, then you want to find the n non and the c such that uh, you know for on n greater than n non, then Tn is less than or less than or equal to c times Gn. So. Um, some people have been worrying about the base case, like what and non do you have to select? And I would say, don't worry about that. The, 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 the important part is you, can, you must get the function g correct and the constant c also correct. And once you get those two, and, you, and provided that you can carry out the inductive, the inductive step, then you just can just take a very big value of and non, and that's it. OK? So. Um, um, I'm, I'm showing some example here, but I think we'll go, we will go back to this later after I answer all the questions. Okay, next thing is uh, re, uh, the, the next method to solve recurrence is called a recursion tree. So when, uh, when, you, have, um, uh, when you have a recurrence like, t, like Tn is equal to the, s the sum of a bunch of T, 
and another function. Then this thing will basically create a recursion tree. And you can look at the recursion tree either at the end. So, um, so you look at the decision tree and you try to, to allocate the amount of work that you are doing at each node or at each level of the tree. And for this, just refer back to the lecture to see what we are doing. Um, I don't have much to say about this. It's more about computation. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, yeah, some some miscellaneous things about recurrence. Uh, so don't care about um, flaw or ceiling functions. So flaw and ceiling functions are in the formula, so that they are formal. But when you analyze these things, you can just ignore them. Uh, and you you can um, and when you ignore these things, then you you will have non-integral numbers. So don't care about. Those. So just assume that all the numbers are possible in the function t. Uh, and even if you have some numbers smaller than one, which doesn't make sense because t of n uh, should uh, the n there should be the size of the problem, which should be integral. But even if you have some weird things like something less than one or something non-integral, then just leave it there. Um, yeah. Okay. And then another another thing that we noted noticed from the last two assignments. Uh, so um, sometimes people have a recurrence like I'm showing here. Um, and then the last term, fn, sometimes it's like um, you can just write plus o1 or plus o of n to the fifth or anything. Um, so, uh, and then people have been replaced. For example, when they see the o1 there, they tend to just replace the o1 by the number one. And I want to point out that that is not correct. Uh, so by definition, o1 means that it's less than a constant c. So you can replace o1 with a c. Similarly, you can replace like um, O of n cube by a constant c times n cube, but it's not okay to just drop the constant c. Okay, yeah. Uh, and by the way, if, even if you put a constant c there, they, they wouldn't usually they wouldn't affect your computation or analysis at all. Okay. So the next topic is divide and conquer. Um, so before we go on, uh, I want to answer the questions that you have on asymptotic analysis. OK. Uh, yes? So you said um, for so the term 1 will for sure be on solving recurrences. There will definitely be a problem with a lot of recurrences. Okay. Yeah. Just like the homework. Okay. But they will be less scary than that. Yes? So I just had a general question. Do we get like a cheat sheet or not for the term? Oh. Uh, so according to our last TA meeting, I think you do have a cheat sheet. But uh, if there's... If that is wrong, then I will post a correction on Piazza. Uh, I'm assuming that you do have one. Yeah. OK. Other questions? Sure, I'm going on. So divide and conquer, I don't have much to say about this. It's more about your skill. So the idea is that you have a, a task T, you break them into smaller tasks, you solve each, you solve each of them, and you somehow combine their results to, the, to, the, to, the, um, to, the, um, to get the result of T. So and, and there are many examples of this, like Merce Shock, Quick Shock, or many problems that you have solved in your homeworks. So uh, and, um, if you want more, if you want more practice on this, I'm going to post a link on Piazza to some divine concur problems. Um, but it's more about training your intuition and designing algorithms. Okay, and of many divine concur problems will lead to uh, a recurrence when you analyze the runtime, and that will fall back to the things that we just talked about earlier. So, next topic is sorting. Um, so uh, we covered uh, two main sort. Of, well, I think we cover a lot of sorting algorithms, but I think the two important ones here are Mershock and Quicksort. And then we also talk a little bit about the theoretical bound of sorting algorithms. So, uh, so I'm going to give you a, ref a refresh on on these things. So Mershock uh, is just like this figure is from. Uh, so this, so it's like. When you have to sort an, inter an interval, um, you will break the interval into two halves, and then you sort each of the half interval recursively, and then you merge them. And the, the merge operation, um, um, does anybody not know how to do the merge operation? Sure. And so um, if, you, if you don't know that, then you should read, a, uh, you should read the lecture note. The idea to do that is uh, you keep two pointers on the two things that you merge, and then you keep the smaller. You, you take the smaller one, you put in the merge interval, and then you advance the, the corresponding pointers. 
uh, analysis is very simple. It's Tn equals to this thing on the screen, and by master theorem, you will get n log n. And big O of n log n is a guaranteed uh, complexity for merge shock, which is not the case for quick shock, the thing that we are going to see right now. So, um, so the idea of quick shock is also divide and conquer, just like merge shock. But for merge shock, you uh, you break the interval by the structure of the interval. So if you go, if your interval is from i and j, you will break them at i plus j over two up to some far and or ceiling something. But for quick sort, um, you have an interval. You, the, if you have a bunch of numbers, you need to sort. The first thing you do is you select a pivot. There are many ways to select the pivot. So uh, people, uh, so if you implement the algorithm incorrectly, you just take the um, you just take the first number as a pivot, or just take the middle number as a pivot, or take a random number as a pivot. Many ways to do that. And then after you pick the pivot, you um, you divide the interval that you want to solved into two halves, the, the, the path smaller than the pivot and the path greater than the pivot, and then you solve and then you continue to solve those interval um, recursively. So the different things of, about, uh, of quick shock compared to merge shock is that first, um, there is no merging step in the, in the merge shock algorithm. After you solve the interval, you have to merge them. In quick shock, you don't merge them. Um, so, um, so quick sort because because we call it quick sort. So in in reality, quick sort is very fast. It's much faster than merge sort. But theoretically, uh, quick sort have the worst case complexity of O of big O of uh, n square. Um, and this will happen if, for example, you always pick the biggest, the, the largest number as your pivot. But this ca this is uh, this can rarely happen in reality, especially if you pick the pivot as random. And uh, so when you when you pick the pivot as random, then the expected runtime of uh, quicksort is bigger of n log n. And what do I mean by expected runtime? Um, um, go understand it more when I talk about. Uh, uh, the decision tree and lower bound of sorting. So, so decision tree is a model to represent the algorithm. So, uh, when you have an algorithm, you basic you basically represent the st the states that you are going through in executing your algorithms into a tree. And you start at a root node. You follow the rules throughout on the trees, and then you will, you will stop when you reach a leaf. And um, depending on so for for every algorithm that you decide, you will generate one decision tree. So um, and and then the height of the so um, uh, when you go go down the, the decision tree, you will go down some path from the root to the to the leaf, and then the length of that path will uh, represent the the complexity of your algorithm. So uh, I have posted a, 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 a very detailed note on decision tree. And if you read that note, and in that note, I did explain what, it, what does it mean for quicksort to have expected runtime of big O of n log n. So, uh, so you, you should read that post, because it's not very long, and it gives you a very good understanding of decision tree, in my opinion. OK, and also based on decision tree, people can prove a result about sorting algorithms that, OK, so you have been seeing big O of n log n, uh, big O of n log n upper bound ta running time sorting algorithms. And with decision tree, people have proved that, OK, that is actually the best uh, complexity that you can get through. Um, when, you, when you analyze things involved with sorting and decision tree, then, the, then you probably have to deal with factorial. Um, so one, uh, one useful thing to remember about factorial is the uh, Stirling approximation. So OK, I'm not going to write it down since I don't remember it myself. Uh, but um, uh, you should have been able to see it on this from the lecture note. And uh, just if you have a cheat sheet, then just write it down. OK, uh, so any further questions on sorting? OK, good. We're good. We're moving. So OK, a topic that is very related to sorting, but it is not actually sorting, is, is other statistics. 
So uh, order statistic means that so you give you are given n numbers and you want to find the k smallest element. So I'm giving a figure here which basically summarizes the algorithm that we will use to uh, compute um, the k smallest element. So the idea is that you you divide the numbers into groups of five elements and y five uh, y five elements are not another numbers you have. You have done this in the homework, so um, and then you and then you find the medians of each of these five group, uh, these five num five number group, and then you find the median of median. So the median of median will divide your numbers into these four. So the the, the yellow cell here is the median of median. Uh, so half of the median will be less than the median of median, and then all the things that are less than those medians will also be less than the median of median. Okay, there are too many medians. Um, okay, one th one thing to note here is that okay, why am I drawing a figure like uh, the num the num the the number that you have, which is n, is perfectly divisible by four by five. Uh, in fact, of course, you can have a smaller array, but you can just don't care about that because say if you want to find the ten smallest element in out of uh, out of 90, 94 numbers you can just add one very big number into the array and that wouldn't change the other statistic of anything you are trying to find so um, this also leads to one more point about analyzing the algorithm that is okay see if you have uh, n not divisible by 5 you just don't care about them um, um, and yes so this is depicting the lower bound Yes. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So the so the numbers go from a uh, smaller number is uh, is above, and then go down to bigger numbers. Yeah. I, I will add. I will edit the slides. Thank you. Yeah. Um, other questions? Okay. And this algorithm will lead to the recurrence here, and you have solved it in the lecture, or you can just try to solve it again for practice. And and this this algorithm will will lead to the the um, uh, linear time complexity. Okay. Any other question on selecting? Okay. Um, so we have like four minutes. So I'm going to cover very quick the t quickly these two topics. So binary search tree, and then I'm going to talk about hashing. So um, binary search tree. So first of all, it's a binary tree. So each node. Each node P can either has uh, can either have uh, left ch left children, uh, left child and right child, or only one ch one child or both two children, or maybe no no child at all. So in a binary search tree, you want everything in the left subtree of a node to be less than the number in that node. Everything in the right is bigger than the number at that node. That is, and uh, so this is very important because it's not just the direct uh, children of a node P has to have a number smaller than it, but everything in that subtree has to be smaller than the than the number P. So, and there there are there are four basic operations on the tree. So there are search, uh, insert, uh, so search, insert, delete, and rotations. So. Um, so for search, because you so if you want to search for a number, then um, then you just go down the tree in the in the desired direction. Because you know if if you add a node and you you know that the number is bigger than the node, then the number has to be in the right subtree, and so on. So you just go down the tree in that direction. Uh, insert uh, when if you want to insert an element, you you search for you search for an for the position of that element in the tree. And if you found it, then okay, it's there. You are not going to insert it anymore. If it, you don't find it, then you find. It, then you will end up as, as a new node, and then you will just put the elements there. Uh, delete. So you search. You, you search for uh, deletion. You have to search for the node. If it's not in the tree, then there's nothing to remove. If you find it in the tree, then you remove it, and then you check if the node has any children. If it has a left children, then you. If it has only one children, you bring the children up. If it has two children, you have to do some more complicated things. Uh, you you can look for these in the lectures. Um, the time complexity of all these is O H, where H is the height of the tree. Yes. I have a question generally about like complexities and statements that are proved in lecture. Uh -huh. Can we use anything that's been proved in lecture without proof on the exam? Yeah, sure. You can use everything that is proved in the lecture in the, in the exam. Okay. You can also use everything that is proved in the homework in the exam with proper citing to those. Okay. okay? Um, 
Okay, and the last uh, the, the the last operation on the on the binary tree on binary search tree, which is a little more confusing, uh, it is the the rotation. So for so there are left and right rotation that are shown here. So the, I think the 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 trick that I use to memorize these are just that you just think that so uh, if you do a if you do a left rotation. Then the then the thing that you rotate will go will go up to the left. I mean in in the clockwise direction. Uh, and if you do a right right rotation, then the, this thing will go in the uh, counterclockwise direction. And then all the children uh, keep their order. So if you have a three subtrees, uh, if you have three subtrees, so A, B, C, they will still be A, B, C after you rotate. Nothing changed. Nothing changes uh, about the subtrees. Just these, uh, the only changes just go about these two things. And if you so, uh, I think okay, uh, I'm I'm going to show it again. Right rotation, you rotate. Left, you rotate. Yeah. So it's very intuitive to rotate and then just keep the subtrees. Okay. Um, so, okay. So red black tree is uh, basically a mess. So I highly recommend that you will, you should write down the algorithms involved in 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 red black tree into your cheat sheet because for me it's quite impossible to me to to memorize this. And uh, I think uh, if you are not a researcher doing research on red black tree, then you are not going to memorize this anyway. So um, so just write them down. And there 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 is only one one thing about red black tree that I want to uh, note in this section. So the so that is about the the leaves of uh, red black tree. So in some figures, people are not showing the new the the new notes there, uh, but the leaves of red black of red black trees. So first of all, they have to they they have to be black, and uh, and they are the new notes, not the. Uh, not the actual note that you see in the tree. So, uh, for example, just in this situation, the note of number 22 here. Uh, when you draw a tree, you will not draw the new note here. Um, and you will think that 22 is the leaf of a tree. No, but 22 is not a note, uh, is not the leaf of a tree. Uh, and so it, basi it basically means that uh, every note in a red flag tree must have two children. So, like, uh, the number one here, it has only one real children, one, sorry, one real child. So you give it an, a new child. And then for, the, notes that, for the, the actual leaf note that doesn't have any child, it actually means that it has two new children. Okay. Yeah, um, so I'm running over time. We're going to talk about hash table very quick. Um, so hash table, you have a, you, you have a bunch of things. Uh, you have a bunch of objects. And you decide a hash function to hash these objects into um, into a, a key set, which we call the universe. So, um, if your uni if your universe has only m elements, that like so, those are m possible keys to hash into. Then, um, then th this will lead to a hash table with m um, with m entries. So, whenever you when so hash table will support adding, searching, and probably deleting an element. So when you have when you give it an element, the first thing the hashing the the hash table does is compute the hash value, and then um, depending on what happens in the hash table, um, things will happen. Uh, um, it it will do the the desired action. So so um, so we talk about two approaches to implement hash table in the class. So they are chaining and open hashing. So I'm going to give a comparison here. It's more intuitive to understand. So if you, if you are given a, a new number, so on the left, it is chaining, and on the right, it's open address. So for chaining, so you just, um, when you are given a number, you compute the hash value. The hash value will tell you which or where in the hash table to look at. So say if you are, if if says that you are you have to look into this hash table. So uh, sorry, this entry. So in the in the chaining approach, each entry in the hash table in the hash table is essentially a linked list. So if it's an, an empty entry, then you just put the new entry here. If it's if uh, if there is already some entries that are hashed, uh, some some objects that are hashed into this uh, entries, 
then you will have to traverse the link list to prop to put this part thing at a proper uh, at a proper place in the link in the link list, um, and similar for searching and the del and deleting elements. So. Um, so uh, in the in the chaining in the chaining approach, we usually we usually use a notation of alpha where alpha is equal to n over m, and it's n is the number of objects in the table, and m is the size of the table. So this basically says, okay, how uh, uh, am I saturating the table too much? And then the expected the expected runtime of any operations in the chaining hash. Uh, so insert, delete, or search, uh, they are on uh, bigger of one plus alpha. So open address hashing is another approach to hashing. Uh, it's, it's actually just another approach to resolving uh, collisions. So in, uh, so in chaining, we start linked list. Uh, in open address hashing, we, just, uh, we, 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 we are guaranteed that we will start at most one element at each entry. So uh, the idea is that when you when you are given a um, new uh, um, a new key, um, the, you use the hash function to compute the first position. If that first position is empty, okay, you put the elements there. If it's not empty, then you follow the links that you built up in the hash table. So I'm showing here. So there's a link from this point to from this cell to to the cell up there, and then the, from the cell up there to here. So you have to traverse on the link until you either find an empty cell. Or you saturate it, and you say that okay, there's, uh, there can be, uh, we cannot put this element into the hash table. So there are two approaches for so, so these links. They so they are not drawn, they are not stored in the memory, and instead they are computed by some formula. So there are two form there, there are two approaches that we discuss in the lecture. So either line, linear probing. So linear probing is uh, you, whenever you want to you go to the next key by adding a constant. And the other one is double hashing, where you have two hash functions, and you use this formula here. Um, so uh, open address hashing gives you a somewhat better runtime compared to chaining uh, co compared to chaining hashing. So uh, with the same alpha, that is the saturation the saturation rate of your hash table. Then the expected runtime will be alpha over uh, one minus alpha. Okay, so I think I'm pretty done covering the theory. Um, yeah, so uh, I just compressed half a quarter into half an hour, and so I'm going to answer questions that you have about on this topic. I'm trying. So these are the list of topics, uh, and if you don't have any questions on this, then we're going to through to we will we will go to solve some example problems. Okay. Is it possible for the co staff to give us some like practice questions for like maybe last year's midterm work? So we asked Virginia about that, and I think she didn't want to uh, release the last year's midterm. Because it will be very helpful so that we can judge ourselves. What will be the level of the complexity of the exam? And so, um, so at the beginning of this session, I said that there will be three problems in the exam. One will be solving a lot of recurrences, and then there's another short problem and, and another long problem. That is the, the, the complexity that you should expect for the exam. And unfortunately, we cannot give uh, any practice problem, uh, like sample midterm, but we can give practice problems. Yeah. Yes. For probability distributions, like in most of the homeworks, we really only need to know binomial. Do would we need to memorize like other? So I because, so because this class assumes uh, 109 as a prerequisite. So I think you are expected to know binomial. Uh, mm, uh, what else? Well, everything from 109. Normal, uh, Poisson. Uh, so basically, all the, all those things. Yeah, but you, uh, you will not see all of them in the midterms, but of course you're expected to know all of them. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay, so uh, let's do some practice. So, okay, so... 
so let's try to solve the following uh, recurrence recurrences. Uh, let, let me see which one should we start from. Okay, um, let's try to solve something with a name. So uh, the the, Fib the Fib uh, so so we'll look at the Fibonacci recurrence because it's quite uh, interesting in my opinion to to look at. So. Um, and it shows it, it, it will actually shows a lot of intuition about the substitution method. So uh, you are asked to solve. Okay, should I turn on the light? Um, I don't know how to turn on the light. Uh, anyway, um, that's fine. Uh, just. So can everyone see this? Uh, okay, I really hope that I can turn on the light. But um, sorry, I don't really know how to. Um, no, no. Fine. Okay. Uh, if uh, nobody is going to help me to turn on the light, then we'll go with this. Okay. So. Um, uh, so this kind of recurrence shows you the um, the thing that you see in Fibonacci number. So Fibonacci number is just a it's just a, it's just a sequence of numbers where each number is the sum of two previous numbers. So uh, so those are so the the first two numbers are one and then two, three, five, eight, thirteen, and so on. So these are called Fibonacci numbers and. Uh, this kind of recurrence, this recurrence here, uh, shows the Fibonacci recurrence. So we'll see how can we solve it. So, so I want to emphasize that it is a very nice recurrence to solve because it will give you the the intuition of uh, sub of substitution method. So, um, so I would say that I have no idea. Which num which uh, um, which upper bound this thing will solve it will solve into, and so I'm go I'm going to make a guess, um, and the guess will be based on the numbers that I see. So if you compute the Fibonacci numbers, uh, if you write out the, the sequence of Fibonacci numbers, uh, which I just did, and you write you write them down to I think ten or fifteen numbers, you will see that the numbers grow very quickly. So the guess is that. Uh, um, so, so the guess is that Tn will be upper bounded by some um, exponential function. Uh, but we we cannot guess uh, we cannot guess what is the number what what is the the constant that we will put into the um, uh, the the function here. So. Um, so how how can we find out this number c? So uh, we'll try to do substitution method. So, so this is our guess. So we will. So first of all, we will not care about the the n zero, the base case in the induction. What you will do is just that you assume that um, that uh, t of n prime is less than or equal to. Okay, I because I use a number c here already, so I will use an another letter, which is d uh, n prime, uh, for all n prime less than n. And then, by, and then you, to use substitution method, you have to go from this one to n. So in order to go from smaller numbers to the number n, then you have to, base, you have to use a recurrence. So uh, the recurrence here is tn. So, so I have tn equals to uh, t of n plus 1 plus t of n uh, minus, minus 1 and n plus t of n minus 2. So, so now I can use the, um, the inductive hypothesis on, on this and on this. So, I want to, so this will be less than or equal to d times c to the power of n minus 1. So this uh, uh, this is where I'm using the hypothesis here. So in order for this for this thing to work, I have to 
make this thing, uh, make this happen. Okay, so I have to make this thing less than or equal to d times uh, c to the n to to the power of n because I, this is what I want to show. Uh, I want to show that t n is less than d times uh, c to the n at the end of the day. So I I I will choose the values of d and of c in order to make this happen. So. So um, this is so um, I, I want this to happen, right? So the number the the, the number d here, I can I can see that the number the the constant d here doesn't matter. I can, uh, because whatever constant d that I choose, uh, in when I try to to solve this inequality, the the d will cancel. So. Uh, so I can just don't care about d at all, and I will say that this is uh, equivalent to c to the n minus one uh, plus c to the n minus two, less than or equal to c to the n. Okay, um, and then uh, so how how can I solve this? Um, this will be equi so there is a c to the n, c to the n, and c to the n here. So I'm just uh, so if I divide everything by c to the n minus 2, then I will have c uh, plus 1 less than or equal to c uh, squared. And to get this, I, actually, I divided both sides by c to the n minus 2. OK. Um, so, so this is something that you solve in high school, which is called uh, quadratic equations. So I can just select C. Such that uh, C plus, so I just need a less than or equal to. So I just put an equal. And then this will be equivalent to uh, uh, c squared minus c minus 1 equal to 0. Okay, and then you solve this. This will give you, uh, this is this number, uh, 1 plus Okay, uh, so so this is a this is the number c that you found by uh, focusing on these things to to make your induction works. So go back to the go go back to the original point. Um, yeah, go, go, going back to the original point because we have go, we have gone through on the induction. So we can so now we can say that uh, T n is big O of uh, okay, one plus square root of five over two to the n. And I believe many people have seen this number. That this is just called this is called the the golden ratio, and this shows up in a lot of places. Yeah. So the so uh, so I what I want to note from this example is that is uh, is the way that you make a guess. So. I did, so I, I definitely cannot come up with this number from the universe or anything. But I came up with, with this number uh, by doing the math in order to make the, the induction that I will use in substitution method works. OK, so uh, any questions on this? Yes? Um, if there's a recurrence on the exam that has a more challenging algebra problem, is it sufficient to just pick some arbitrary value of C that satisfies C plus one is less than or equal to C squared, and use that first. Yeah, I think that's fine. Yeah. So if I think if you have a uh, if you have a so T n is T n minus one plus T n minus two plus T n minus five or something, then and then and you try to solve this thing, you will have a f a fifth degree equation which is not possible to solve, and then you can just you can just say that okay, just take any number that makes that uh, that thing work. Okay. Any other questions on this uh, example? 
Sure. Uh, so we have six minutes. So six minutes uh, are in, uh, enough to either go through a divide and conquer problems or I can go through another recurrence problem. Which one would you prefer to see? No appeal. Divide and conquer. Okay, so I'm going to give. Uh, I'm going to show to give a divide and conquer problems, and then um, just one problem, and then try to solve it. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to give you a problem that I have seen in one of my job interviews. <laughs> so um, and so, uh, so I give this problem because it involves another um, concept that we we'll, that we have covered. So it's it's like so it's this problem. So you are given a binary tree. Uh, T. So. So it's it's only a binary binary tree. It's not a binary search tree, right? So uh, then the question is actually to determine uh, if T is a binary search tree. So um, it, so to determine whether something is a binary search tree, you you have to verify if it. Uh, if it com complies on the properties of binary search tree, so on numbers in the, you know, on numbers in the, uh, so yeah, sorry, yeah, that's fine. So on numbers in these subtrees will be less than this, and on numbers in this subtree will sh uh, will be greater than this, and that should recursively holds for on the previous for for on the uh, sub for on the two descendants of this thing in the tree. So, uh, wh so why is it? Uh, so why do I say this is a uh, divide and conquer problem? Because um, you know, so um, so because the pr the essence of the pr the problem has the divide and conquer uh, essence. The, um, so if so, if you if you are at a node p in a tree. Um, so if so, okay. So I don't know. Okay. So if you start from okay. So if you start from somewhere I don't know in the tree, and then you you are you see in a subtree, and if you see that this subtree violates the property of binary search tree, then the whole then the whole tree will not be a binary search tree. So in other words, in order to confirm that the tree is a binary search tree, you have to make sure you have to go to, go through on the subsequent levels of it, on the nodes of it, and make sure on those subtrees are binary search trees. So if we look at that from a recurrence perspective, then you are so instead of saying that okay, I'm given a tree, I would say that okay, give me a node, and that node will represent a subtree. Uh, a subtree of that node in the tree, and then originally you will just solve it at the original node. So if you add a node, p, if you add a, at a node p, you you recursively check to see if this if uh, p dot left and p dot right are binary search tree. Uh, and so if these things are binary, are both binary search trees, then you then you just check whether the combination, which is a subtree here, is also a binary search tree, and that's how it works. So um, so I think the so one way to do this is yeah, is to so um, so also so if you if you have an if you have a sub -tree, if you have a node in the tree then uh, and you and you are sure that it is a binary search tree then you can find the largest number in the in this subtree very easily and you can also find the smallest number in this subtree. Easily because you know those are binary search trees. So so then you just compare if the largest number here 
is smaller than p, and then the smallest number here is larger than p, and that is uh, and and that will be it. So uh, th that will be the ideas of the, of the algorithm. Uh, so I, unfortunately, I don't think I will have enough time to write out the algorithm. So prop so I'll try to include it into the slide and then pass it onto Piazza as a note to this. Um, yeah. So I think that concludes the session. And if anybody has any questions, I can stay later for to to answer. Okay. Yeah.